on 26th April 2018. Kiharu, Moranga County, witnessed a state funeral, only lacking a 21-gun salute. But everyone came. President Uhuru Kenyatta, Deputy President William Ruto, former Prime Minister Railo Dinga, foreign envoys, religious leaders and the villagers too. They all attended the funeral of Kenneth Stanley Njindo Matiba. The following day, the body of Kenneth Matiba was cremated at the Langata Cemetery. But the dignified send-off was a clear recognition of the political weight of Matiba, a man many acknowledged as phenomenal. After Jaramogi, I would say of the others who have run for the office of the president, Kenneth Matiba was the best president that we never had. In the 1980s and the 90s, President Daniel Arap Moy ruled the roast, and he did so with a heavy hand. Political assassinations and detention without trial were commonplace. A minister, Robert Ouko, was killed and dumped in a hillside thicket. An outspoken clergyman, Alexander Muge, was killed in a suspicious road accident. But then the Berlin Wall was coming down and with it, international pressure on African strongmen to open up democratic space. And the flame was lit right under Moi's regime with the number of critics swelling by the day. Agitators for multipartism multiplied and they included Moi's own former minister, Kenneth Matiba. We were convinced that the dictatorship environment we had in Kenya it was because of the Katiba. The constitution allowed it. And uh, people also, our own uh, citizens, created dictators by call, almost calling them gods or not. Uh, that is the time at which I met Matiba. I was very impressed because remember I was also editing the Nairobi Law Mandela at that time. I was very, very impressed. So when Matiba and uh, Rubia signed that uh, famous letter, uh, asking for a license to hold a meeting at uh, Kamukunji, there was a lot of excitement. Uh, we were ready to challenge the government because we had seen uh, dictatorships collapse in the Soviet Union. We had a history of heroic resistance which had been uh, repressed by the one-party dictatorship. We felt that we shouldn't miss the opportunity provided by the wind of change. So the call itself galvanized those of us who really were looking for an opportunity to um, challenge the one-party dictatorship. The movement took shape through street protests and unlicensed gatherings which attracted many followers. There were many people involved, lawyers, uh, engineers, church people, of all denominations, and uh, politicians. The first major flashpoint will be the famous Saba Saba rally, which was slated for the 7th of July, 1990. The government immediately outlawed it. The moment Matiba announced that the meeting at Kamukunji will go on with or without a license, we became marked and they started following us. In my offices, you know, uh, because I used to carry, carry out, carry, I used to have a legal practice, you would have, I would be working and a policeman is standing in my office or sitting. Uh, at the door, you know, grab the chair and sat at the door. Not talking, just telling you, you continue with your work. Uh, and they stood there watching every little movement that uh, uh, one was making. So it was not an easy time. Then the crackdown began on July 4th, 1990. 
Matiba and Rubia, among others, were arrested. I was arrested on the 4th, I think the same day that Matiba was arrested. I had gone to State House uh, Primary School to pick my children, and I noticed the cars that were following. There was, you know, Standard 1, I think, and 2. And this, I remember me telling them to, I jotted down the number plates of the cars that was following me. And uh, I was living in Gomo Estate. Mm. I, I told them that mark those cars because and if you don't, if I, we don't get home, whoever it is, just give them the the details of the car that because I, I was sure I was going to be arrested. <laughs> so I drove with these people following me uh, to Gomo Estate. They surrounded the estate. It was not my, my first arrest. It must have been what, the 10th, 15th. So I had this sweater always at the ready when just in case they come. So I wore, I wore it and uh, I opened the door and they, when they saw me, of course, they were very angry. So they started, uh, they threw me into the back of a uh, Pujo 504 and as I remember off, they stopped on the road and they really beat me up. They were very angry because I had kept them, you know, I had hidden and I had uh, got all this media, you know, that had recorded my arrest. So they really beat me up and then they took me to Nairobi area, you know, traffic headquarters. I never knew there were cells there, mm. but below there are cells. And that's when I learned that Matiba had been there. I understood I was at committee, that I knew I was at committee prison, but I did not know where Matiba was. We were kept ignorant. And uh, so they called, you are excommunicated completely, you are darkness. You don't even know what day it is. What cause solitary confinement is very dangerous, punishing you mentally. You even lose time. Life in detention was dark, that only the desire to keep fighting kept many alive. But around midnight, I would say midnight, between midnight and 1 a.m., I was put in a Volkswagen Kombi, a blue one. They opened and then you are told to lie, you know, between, behind the driver, along in the middle but on the floor and of course they would, uh, they would go stepping and singing and you know taunting you and uh, they, the ones who carried me was singing this song Kanya Gai Nchi you know you know really by the time they did the rounds I didn't know where which rounds I had almost passed out and I was bleeding I was, um, but eventually we stopped of course at that time I was blindfolded uh, and I was completely prepared for death because uh, I couldn't see another possibility of the kind of beatings you received, including the, on the head. I thought they were definitely going, not going to release me. So I came to terms and I started thinking about death and I thought about death many times uh, uh, during that time because I'd been in prison for more than two years before. And uh, I'd read books on how to prepare for detention. We decided that we had to go to Kampunji. First of all, to, to give people courage, because at that time, you know, to appear in a rally which had been declared illegal, and with that uh, kind of security, uh, detail uh, mounted to ensure that people don't take part in the meeting. Uh, uh, we, we were sure, uh, you know, that uh, you know a lot of leaders will not turn up, or many people will not turn up. But yet, out there, people were clamoring that come out. Uh, you know, tear gas was being thrown and hurled everywhere. So we said, you know, we cannot let the people down. And we said, okay, well, let's get into this pickup. And as we went, because we know the ground, the grounds of the Kampunji had been occupied by the police. So as we went through uh, the Kaloleni, Bama, uh, Majengo, uh, California area, we said, you know, we must see the people, show the people that we had actually gotten into the area, if not uh, to the to Kampunji itself. But all of us, knew we were going to be arrested. We were sure we were going to end up in a prison or a, or a police cell. Many people died, 
prisons had new inmates. The court had new clans to be tried and jailed hastily by willing judges. Foreign missions had new applications from asylum seekers keen to escape and leave to fight another day. We had the kills up, were killed, killed later <clears throat> in, Paris, in prison. Because again, human beings, what he is, even warders would whisper to us, uh, <laughs> We had also some warders who uh, would sneak up my information, but uh, the campaign went on, even while we were in, and there was so much noise to release us. I don't think President Moy did anything outside the law in terms of arrests and detentions. Because there was a provision in the law that a person shall be detained by the president. It was in the law. He found it in the law from independence. The rally never happened, but Kenya changed. Saba Saba came to be the symbol of defiance against the Kanu regime, and that triggered the multi party debate. The flame of liberation was lit, and Moy and Kanu realized that change was inevitable. Moy called up a conference at KICC. He called it Kanu National Conference to decide on the constitution. Right? And he, and, uh, and he had a field day. So he allowed them to speak. A very clever man. He allowed people to defend him. What do you think? Should we change? Should we, should we not change? He allowed them to defend him. So he listened to everybody. He now said, uh, I have heard you. I now also want to make my own statement. A day before the day, Franklin Bate, then Moe's most trusted Deputy State House Controller, was given a delicate duty to perform. He was asked to prepare two speeches, one outlining the importance of retaining Section 2A in the Constitution and another calling for its immediate repeal to allow multi-party politics. It was a secret that only Bet and President Moy knew. When he told me, because I was sitting behind there, he told me, give me my speech. Then I told him, you know, you have got to say the one which he's saying, we repeal to it. He read his speech, the first pages. When he now reached that one, he now said, Mimi, Yale Ambao ni Nayaona Mbele, Nikali Kuliko to Nayaona Hapa. So Lassima to Giokoe. Now, the first real opposition party, Forum for Restoration of Democracy Forward, was riding high on the wave of change. Then President Moy's once trusted friends started to desert him. They went, one by one, but it was the resignation of then Health Cabinet Minister Mwai Kibaki that shocked many. He was to be joined by a host of powerful politicians, mainly from Central Kenya region, to form the Democratic Party, DP. He was to become a formidable opponent to Kanu, but it was Ford which was to pose the real challenge. It attracted hundreds and thousands of supporters, and for a while it looked set to seize power from Moy and Kanu. At this time, Kanu was facing defeat. A poll by the late Professor Wangari Madai had showed that Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga was the man most likely to beat Moy in the 1992 presidential contest. According to the poll that Wangari Madai was taking at that time, um, you know, and according to her, Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga was the most favored person. To, the, to be the president of the Republic of Kenya. But that was long before the disintegration, apart from DP eating into its support base, Ford, the once indomitable party, split into two. Kenyan, very sad, tragic story 
of uh, our ethnicity um, began. And they began with us in, 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 in the Young Tax movement because uh, you remember after the, uh, the elections, uh, after the breakup of uh, the two forts, we fought Kenya, fought Asili, Jaramogi leading um, uh, Ford Kenya. We had that historic meeting at, at the um, uh, City Stadium where Paul Mita became the first vice chairman and uh, Mola Kijana, the second vice chairman. I became the secretary general. And that was the beginning of the, <coughs> of the, the divisions because there was among our group who felt that uh, because of the advanced age of Jaramogi, uh, if he didn't make it to the president because of age, then the city would again fall to uh, Kikuyu, and uh, they were not prepared for that. There will be they will say all sorts of things, but that was the truth. They fought very hard to ensure that Jaramogi would not be succeeded by uh, Kikuyu in in Ford, uh, Ford Kenya. So they engineered the removal for Paul Muite my own removal because at that time uh, Raila was supporting Munyo Yaki to become Secretary General uh, because he had a longer history of relationship with the family um, and that, that was the beginning actually it started the breakup began on the very first day and uh, there was a feeling that because Ford Asili is led uh, by Akikuyu we shouldn't allow a possibility where the other Ford is also led by Akikuyu. And that was the beginning of the end of the two Fords, uh, unfortunately. And Moy saw it. Moy saw it and he exploited it to the maximum. Kenneth Matiba is out in London for some medical treatment. And, and he's coming back. And the man who is leading Ford is Jaramogi Oginga Odinga. Jaramogi Odinga is slightly older than Kenneth Matiba. So you put into the head of Kenneth Matiba that it is time for Jaramogi Oginga Odinga to go where? Go home. So when he's coming, I'm younger and he's old and he has had his time. He needs to go away. So that's what was done. Kenneth Matiba was given that impression just by some statements. Some st uh, and, and, and secondly, you know, they told him that, you know, if he did not take his chance, then, then Mwai Kibaki was going to, to eclipse him. Uh, uh, and uh, Matiba was taken in, uh, but not absolutely, until the day when he came back. I have absolutely no hesitation in saying that the day Mwai Kibaki formed the Democratic Party, uh, is a day that uh, any democratic transition uh, uh, resulting in the leadership of any of us who was in the, that early stage of second revolution was taken away. Uh, because uh, I remember very well, we had gone with Paul Muita to London to talk to Matiba while he was then recovering. And uh, after a great persuasion, Matiba had actually agreed to stand down for Jeremy. And then out of the blue came this announcement from uh, somebody, uh, Matiba, called General Kigoya, uh, announcing the formation of DP. And this got Matiba so annoyed. He said, if Kibake is standing, I am going to run for president. And it was single-minded. And then when he came, he had a very good reception at the airport, our president. This the first thing he did when he now landed in Ford was a big quarrel with Jaramogi Odinga. Because it was entered into him that you are also able to be the president. It was done deliberately by some people away uh, Ford. So he got into it. He got into the trap. And that trap caused, caused a split in Ford. Then you ended up having Ford Kenya and then you now ended up having, having Ford uh, Asili. Now Ford Kenya says we are the first one, so we are the ones who are known in Kenya. So they call themselves Ford Kenya. Matiba said, I am Asili. Uh, I think he was financing Ford all the time from the beginning. So he said, Mimini Asili. So he said, Ford Asili. Not long from there, then we got Ford P. Now Asante 
And so Moi won the 1992 elections against a divided opposition. We were never able to reach the threshold. The only one who was getting the threshold was Kano. Although it was a very low, it was a dismal uh, threshold. But there he was. There was no law that was denying a person of that threshold at that time, unlike now. Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga and Kenneth Njindo Matiba died not having fulfilled their presidential ambitions. If there are no divisions, mm. what will happen? No, I think if there were no divisions, I think we would have had uh, uh, Jaramogi as president and we would have had Masindo Muliro as uh, deputy or vice president. And I think in that government, uh, Matiba would have played a very crucial role and a role uh, which would have ended up, you know, with an amendment, amendment of the constitution, with an enhancement of that position that, uh, you know, um, absent uh, his health uh, problems, uh, he would have, uh, between him and Muliro, uh, risen to power or share power after Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga presidency. Then Jaramogi would have been the president of Kenya, my own view.